Good evening, everybody, and thank you all so much for joining us tonight for this live stream for families. We know there are some parents out there as well as some kiddos with us tonight. If you have a question from either your kids or yourselves, just type it in the comment section of this video and we'll answer as many of the questions as we can over the next uh, hour or so. I am Rebecca Schultz, the Minister of Children's Services, and I am here with Dr. Dina Hinshaw, who many of you know, Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health. I know she is a familiar face to many of you, and we're so grateful for her leadership during this very unprecedented health crisis that we find ourselves in. Also, as moms to small kids, we do recognize how challenging the past number of months have been for families. That's why we wanted to take some time tonight to answer any questions you may have. Anything to add? No, I mean, I, I think uh, you and I both know that uh, kids sometimes express their fear and their concern in ways that can be challenging and they also ask really great questions and help us to, to see different sides of all experiences, whether they're challenging like the pandemic or, mm -hmm. or good ones. So I'll be really interested to hear what kinds of questions come out and happy to, to do my best to answer them, but I know I can't answer all my kids' questions, so there may be things that we need to take away. So that would be the only thing I would add. Awesome. Well, I think we can just jump right into the questions. So I'll read them out uh, and we'll do our best to answer them as we go. Let's see what our first questions are. So one of the first questions um, that we had gotten was around whether children are going to be able to play outdoor activities like soccer or baseball this summer. And honestly, that's a question that we're still working on because uh, one of the things that we're looking at is the uh, numbers as we start to slowly open up again and what kinds of numbers we get if we're seeing increased transmission. So we haven't made a final decision yet about summer sports. Uh, one of the things that we're saying when people are asking what they can do right now, you know, can they go to the park, can they play with friends? Uh, right now, what the rules are would be that any gathering of less than 15, where people are able to stay two meters apart, and if you're doing something like kicking a ball back and forth, that's completely fine. At the moment, we're recommending that people not play sports where they're throwing things back and forth, like a, a frisbee or a, a baseball, um, unless, of course, it's members of the same household, mm -hmm. that's totally fine. So I know that's really tough and kids want to play together and they, they want to be able to play in the way that they normally do. And I know that lots of kids and lots of organizations want to know about summer sports, outdoor sports, uh, and we are considering what options we might have. Uh, however, at the moment, uh, again, we're, we're focusing on some of those stage one pieces and mm -hmm. recommending that people follow the rules that are currently in place and that as time goes by and we watch our numbers, we'll be able to make better recommendations. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not seeing our questions popping up on the side screen, but luckily parents have, and, and kids as well, have been sending in their questions all day. So we've got a list to get us started here. Um, the other question that we had was around basketball courts and playgrounds. And what are the rules around that? I know some of the uh, families had been asking, we see tape on our uh, local playground equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the rules gonna be around that? So playgrounds, a lot of cities actually, a lot of municipalities had chosen to shut down playgrounds, which is where that, that yellow tape had come from to make sure that kids knew that the playgrounds were off limits. Uh, so technically from the provincial perspective, we didn't put any legal restrictions on playgrounds. However, of course, playgrounds have a lot of surfaces that a lot of kids touch, so they absolutely can you know, potentially be a concern. And so we don't have uh, any, again, formal restrictions, so there would be some of that decision up to the municipalities about when they might uh, lift those restrictions on playgrounds. You know, my recommendation, again, at the moment, because we are pretty early still in this relaunch phase, is to still be cautious and to not be out on playgrounds. Uh, because, again, when lots of kids are playing in the same space, playing close together, and especially all touching the same equipment, uh, there could be a risk of transmission between those kids. Mm -hmm. Things like basketball courts, again, I think it really depends on who all is playing there. If it's members of the same household, if it's uh, people together in a cohort family, we've talked about that concept of cohort families where if there's a family with, with kids that you and your kids 
have decided to, to cohort together, um, then things like basketball would be fine within that group. But we are recommending that there not be groups of people together who are playing games that involve everyone touching mm -hmm. the same surface. So basketball would be one of those things. You know, if people each had their own basketball and you were all gathered around a net two meters apart and shooting hoops, totally fine. It's just about trying to think of ways that you can be together while maintaining mm -hmm. that distance and not having commonly handled items. I think that's a good answer. And I actually think the question about cohort cohort families is one that we do hear again. So for those parents and families out there who may not know, okay, what, what does that exactly mean? I think it might be helpful to give them a short, brief description of what that is. Sure. So when um, we were, you know, several weeks ago, kind of thinking about ways to give advice to help families in particular, but this could apply uh, not just to families with young kids, it you know, could apply to older people as well, that really the, the risk of transmission is about how many different people you interact with uh, and are closer than two meters to mm -hmm. or sharing commonly handled items, uh, sharing a meal together. And those are all t uh, types of activities where you can be close together and, and the possibility of transmitting virus. So what we recommended was uh, especially because I know for young kids it can be really tough to not have other kids to play with. To think of another family who uh, is willing to cohort with you, meaning that uh, the two families agree to not be spending a lot of time with any other families where uh, the kids would be close together, the adults would be close together, and in that way kind of create uh, an expanded household in some ways where the um, the children could play together, the adults could you know, have a meal together and really support each other because it's, it's hard parenting young kids. And sometimes when you can have other families over and have the kids play together, it can just create a little bit of space for the adults to commiserate or support each mm -hmm. other, uh, maybe even swap childcare. And so the concept was to really allow that to happen within that two family um, mm -hmm. connection. But to, to maintain that closure between the two families so that you're not having these two families and then each of them have sort of other cohort families and you end up with the big network. So really it's about those two families that stay together. That's a really great answer. Um, and so one of our first questions that came in today is from a young child uh, who is in care who says, when will I be able to visit with my family again? I know I needed to keep myself and my foster family safe, but I miss seeing my mom. Well, I can tell you that I know how difficult this must be for both you and for your mom. Um, these protocols were put in place um, to keep you and your family safe. Uh, we know that video conferencing right now was the safest way that we could recommend that those visits would happen. Um, but my ministry is working really hard right now, along with Dr. Hinshaw's office, to find parameters, or I shouldn't say parameters, uh, simple ways uh, that you can still see your family in person. We wanna make sure that that can happen uh, as soon as possible and figure out a way that we can start those visits again really soon. Next question we have coming up here is from, not quite moving up but we did have another question about daycares and I think um, that came up today is okay we we see that there is a uh, stage coming up stage one May 14th does that what does that mean does that mean we get started and families have child care right on May 14th uh, or is it a wait and see and I think uh, we were talking about this just before we got started here today and so I think that would be some helpful uh, tips to share with parents as well sure and uh First, let me say that I know that one of the things that has been so difficult in this pandemic is the loss of our ability to make plans uh, and to be able to know exactly what we're going to be doing you know, next week or a month from now. Can we plan a summer vacation? You know, So many things that we wish we had more certainty on. And childcare absolutely is one of those things. So uh, I wish that I could right now give exact certainty about dates and times. Uh, but what I can say is that, as you know, daycare is one of the one of the businesses, one of the the areas that is set for our stage one of relaunch, uh, and the earliest possible date for that to go would be May 14th. Uh, however, the decision about whether or not to go at that stage or whether there might be additional restrictions, uh, the, all of that is going to happen at a presentation 
uh, at the Emergency Management Cabinet Committee next week. So unfortunately, we won't know for sure mm -hmm. until uh, Wednesday is when we'll be able to publicly announce the plan, which is only, I know, just one day before uh, the date, the earliest possible date of relaunch. So what I would say is that for all those who operate childcare facilities and who are wondering about uh, should we be planning to open, should we not be, uh, I think the it is possible that there could be an announcement Wednesday that yes, Thursday is the opening date. It's also possible that we may need to push things out a bit depending on what our numbers are, what our cases are like. Uh, so unfortunately, um, that, that does make it challenging, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's there's no guarantees for the 14th and each business is going to have to figure out how to prepare knowing that there is that bit of uncertainty. So again, uh, my apologies, I know this isn't perfect, uh, but we do want to make sure that we're taking into account the data, the cases, the risk as we make our mm -hmm. final decision about whether or not to go with May 14th. And I think, uh, too, it's that we don't have to start up on May 14th, but yeah. that you are able to. And I know um, many centres are reaching out to parents uh, to see what are their plans, um, what is their situation looking like, and we'll be doing another town hall with our child care uh, operators in the coming days to share more information on that. Uh, we have a great question from Karina here. My children are wondering if it is safe for them to have a sleepover at Grandma and Grandpa's. They have been home and nowhere else since school closed. And I think I would take a guess, Dr. Hinshaw, that this would be like the cohort family potentially that we just discussed if neither of those families had been spending time with other families. That would likely be a safe scenario. Is that a good guess? <laughs> yeah, so certainly if the, if the children have been nowhere else, they haven't been outside uh, the house or, or the surrounding area um, for two weeks or more, it sounds like since school closed, uh, then the likelihood that they've been exposed would be extremely low. I think that as we move into relaunch, we'll have a lot of questions about visiting of, of kids and their grandparents and whether or not it's safe. In this particular scenario, again, given that the, the children, it sounds like, really haven't had any contacts, um, then that should be you know, no problem. Uh, but as, as we start to kind of ease off and, and children might be spending time with friends, uh, then that risk might increase. And I think each family is going to have to determine how they want to manage that, what uh, they would consider to be safe for them. And we are certainly not going to impose any rules about kids visiting grandparents. It's really going to be about managing um, the, uh, the risk and managing the visits in a way that, uh, you know, in the future, if the children had been outside or playing with friends, um, then maybe the visits would need to happen in a slightly different way. Uh, but in this context, I would agree that I think there would be very little risk for those children to have a sleepover with their grandparents. Now we have a question from four-year-old Edgar and he asks, when can I hug my friends? He goes to a child care center. Mm -hmm. I've been asking the same question. I'll tell you, Edgar, that's an excellent one. Um, I think this is something that we've also talked about a lot too, and especially with the child care parameters. How do you um, get children to stay socially, physically distant from each other, which mm -hmm my children under under five so I know that's near impossible but that's where I think we've talked a lot about um, as much as we can ensuring that there is space in a child care setting um, limiting the amount of people that are in a room so we can kind of give kids that space but also just making sure that you know we've got to wash our hands washing our hands for 20 seconds is really important in killing the germs that cause this virus or as my son calls it a virus uh, the V's are a little tricky for him, <laughs> um, but I guess, you know, that that's a question that I ask all the time. When can I hug my friends? Is that a wait and see? We're not really sure yet, but be safe and careful and wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we always, we always need to be washing our hands. That's going to be a, a given for the foreseeable future. You know, I think it's it's so hard to not be able to show our friends that we care about them in ways that we're used to, whether that's a, a hug or a pat on the shoulder. Um, and I think as we're learning how to live in this new world and trying to figure out, you know, how, how do we say hi to our friends? How do we tell them we care about them? Um, I think, again, it sounds like Edgar goes to a, a child care centre. So in that case, if you have a small number of kids who are in the same childcare center and they're spending all day together, 
uh, especially the younger kids, it, it will be very difficult to have them stay distance from each other that entire time. Um, and so I think really it's about finding what particular groups and whether you would envision that particular small you know, childcare group to be perhaps again part of more of a cohort. Uh, again, you know, if, if somebody is sad and needs a hug to cheer them up, you know, sometimes I think they just need a hug. So y you need to make sure that you're, you're doing it. If, if anybody is sick, they should be staying home and, and not going to the child care center. Uh, but your, your hugs need to be given to the people who are closest to you and the people that you don't see that much or you don't spend a lot of time with. That's where maybe you can do a virtual hug where you each kind of do this and you hug yourself and you, and you tell them that you love them, um, but you don't need to, to hug them. You kind of give each other a virtual hug. That's a great question, Edgar. Thank you so much. We have a grade seven student from Edmonton uh, who asked a couple of questions here. So when will I be able to go back to school to learn? When can I go back to church? Will I be able to have fun this summer? And why can't people who are healthy be allowed to go out and create antibodies against the virus while the vulnerable stay home until the virus is gone? I laughed when I read that because I know I've told you the story where my son, any parents out there, uh, if you have Netflix and your kids watch Storybots, my son was very confused about why he wasn't allowed to go out. And he said it when we got the flu shots and he said it when he got his vaccinations and he said, Mom, I don't know I don't know why we have to worry about the virus because we've already got the shot and we have antibodies and we have the white blood cells and then he really shocked me when he said and then the macrophage gobbles them up <laughs> and so I thought okay I'm not really sure that I knew what a macrophage was but I do now thanks to Storybot so it's a it's a good educational show um, but that's a great question uh, from a grade 7 student so I think we can walk through those around school um, I know that the Minister of Education uh, had just uh, said the other day that school in, in school classes will not resume before the end of June, but she is working with school divisions and with teachers and getting feedback from parents across the province uh, so that we can create a plan for that. Um, and then in terms of the rest of the questions, I think Dr. Hinshaw, I'll hand it over to you. Sure, so uh, that question about going back to church, you know, I've had a lot of questions uh, and I absolutely understand because there's so many places like church where people want to gather, they want to be together in community. And certainly right now, if church uh, communities want to have small gatherings, it's you know, perfectly okay to have gatherings of 15 people or less, which I know is quite small. Uh, but at the moment, we are wanting to encourage people to be cautious. Uh, we have seen in early March, before we did our um, started to have our public health uh, measures in place, we did see some groups, some church groups that had gotten together where the virus spread quite quickly. Uh, and I just today was speaking about a particular uh, faith community and, and that had this kind of a gathering. And unfortunately, uh, just over half of the people who were there got sick and two people died and and so it just is a reminder that when we have social gatherings or gatherings of a, of a church or of other kind of a faith group that if people are close together if they're gathering in a social way the virus can spread quickly so we need to be cautious uh, those groups can meet but it needs to be in small numbers right now uh, and things like singing, which I know, you know we all take for granted, but singing actually, singing in groups is something that uh, is risky because singing actually can propel the virus farther than just talking. And so there are certain things that we're used to being able to do that we're going to have to put a pause on for a while, unfortunately. Will I be able to have fun this summer? Absolutely. <laughs> there's, no, there's no ban on fun, let me be clear. Um, so, you know, we are looking at, at all the ways that we can make activities safer and what kinds of activities we are going to be able to support people to do. We want to make the summer fun and mm -hmm. safe for everyone, for kids and adults alike. And so we are being cautious right now because it is just this early stage of opening things back up. Uh, but yes, we're, we're going to make sure that uh, people have lots of opportunities to have fun maybe in slightly different ways than they're used to, but yes, absolutely. The last question is one that I get a lot, and I think there's a, um, there's a, a way of thinking about the virus that um, 
because we know that most people who get the virus who are otherwise healthy have relatively um, little symptoms or you know, they can be, have quite mild disease, they don't get that sick. And so there's a temptation to feel like we can just ask people, maybe people who are older, people who have lots of medical conditions, to stay home for a couple of months while everyone else goes out and goes about their daily business. And as you, know, you say in this question, then everyone has antibodies and then we can let the vulnerable out and they would be protected. The, there's two problems with that. One problem with that is that, um, unfortunately, we don't know for sure if getting the virus once means that you have protective levels of antibodies uh, in the future. We think it's probably likely, but we don't know for sure. And so it would be uh, a real problem if we did that and then found out that actually you can get the virus multiple times. So there's so much we're still learning about the virus um, and we don't know for sure about that question of immunity. The second challenge is that a lot of people have conditions that put them at risk. So it's not just the very old and those who are very ill. You know, a lot of people have something like asthma, a lot of people have high blood pressure, some of these really common conditions that can put people at risk of severe disease. And sometimes people who are young and otherwise healthy can still have severe disease. And we know that um, in other countries where they've seen a lot of spread of the virus, they have seen people get very, very sick, even if they're young and otherwise healthy. So the more people who get infected, the more chances you have of somebody uh, young and otherwise healthy having that severe disease. And what could happen if we allowed the virus to spread um, amongst you know, everyone without putting barriers in place to stop it is the number of people who got really sick could be higher than our hospital has capacity to uh, give care to. So I know it's hard. I know this whole thing is really tough. Uh, but unfortunately, we're, we're kind of stuck doing the best we can to prevent spread for uh, the next many months. And we do have to help out by preventing that spread even between otherwise healthy people. Well, and I think too, talking about fun, I mean, I think some encouraging things that were part of the relaunch strategy, and I mean, kids can get outside, we can go for bike rides. I saw so many people out. I, I live in Calgary, so Fish Creek Park was full of kids and families out biking, walking, um, but we know that camping uh, will likely open uh, coming up soon, uh, access to parks. Um, so people can still get outside and, and hopefully enjoy Alberta, obviously. Um, you can provide some more specific details in terms of what that might look like over the summer. And then knowing also that summer camps are also part of that relaunch. So maybe we can also just provide a little bit more detail on what that looks mm -hmm. like for families. Yeah, and I, I will say when, when uh, we were talking about summer camps in our relaunch, we were really thinking about uh, day camps. Mm -hmm. So camps where kids would, would go for a particular portion of the day. There's all sorts of different day camps that happen Absolutely. in the summer. Uh, so we, we are, uh, we're still looking at a final decision, but at the mm -hmm. moment we're really not looking at the sleepaway camps, the kind of camps where kids would go and spend a week away. Uh, because it will be really hard to have distancing in those settings. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is are those kinds of day camps where you can have maybe a smaller number of kids and there are things that you can do to keep distancing. But as you say, right, there's, there's lots of options and we're, and we're looking at um, how we can give some advice to those camp operators to make sure that kids stay safe in those settings too. Mm -hmm. And just making sure that the parameters are followed. I know with campgrounds starting to open in June, there will still be specific guidelines, but people can still get outside and enjoy the nice weather this summer. Yeah. So our next question, let's see if we've got a next question popping up here. Not quite yet, but we can. We did get a question. Can I have a birthday party with my friends? I know that's one in my house right now because we have a birthday coming up this weekend. Um, unfortunately, I'm thinking that this is not necessarily. We don't have good news. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I, I think <laughs> you know. I, I've heard um, of a few different ways that people are celebrating birthdays these days. Uh, sometimes by video, uh, having yeah. friends have a video conversation together. 
uh, with cohort families. So again, if you have a family that that you're allowed to play with, doing it doing it that way with a small group. Um, I've also heard of people uh, having kind of friends come by the house at that particular part, that, that particular day, they sort of drive by and wave. And like a birthday parade. Yeah, yeah. it's not the same thing. <laughs> I know it's not the same thing. Uh, but right now, I think other than that small group of, of maybe friends in a cohort family mm -hmm. or um, obviously within your own household, uh, or you know, if you can have a birthday party if you can think of a way for uh, your friends to stay two meters apart at all times, and so maybe going to a park and mm -hmm. uh, and then you know being able to to play together that way. But it's really hard. It's really hard to play together and stay two meters apart at all mm -hmm. times. Uh, and so I think right now we're thinking about different ways of celebrating birthdays and maybe planning for the day when we can open up a little bit more, maybe having a delayed birthday party and making a plan for what that would look like. So our next question from Danielle, um, looking for the recommendations around daycares reopening. And so I can absolutely answer that one. Those are gonna be ready very soon. We'll be sharing those. We've been working on them with Dr. Hinshaw's office. Um, they will be building on the parameters that were put in place for those essential service um, child care centers and so we will be sharing that uh, we're hoping tomorrow uh, and then we will do another town hall to connect with daycare operators and answer any other questions that you may have um, I know many of you as I said before are reaching out to your families continue to do that see what their what their needs are right now um, and hopefully we'll be able to answer m many more of your questions next week so our next question is from Connie and she says, this is a question that many are asking. When a family member has tested positive for COVID-19, can you once again speak to exactly what the team um, you have said you've set up to go into the home in this event to check for the safety of others? And so I think what we're talking about here is, is the contact tracing. And I've heard you speak about that a number of times. I think that's what we're looking at here. So if you can explain this and then what safety measures you would be wanting to see in that situation. Sure, so uh, yeah, there's there's two things. So one is absolutely the contact tracing and the other are, is the, the list of things that we would want people to do if they've tested positive and how to stay safe in the household with others. So uh, the first thing is, you know, if somebody is feeling sick, as soon as they start to feel sick, so as soon as they have you know, a bit of a scratchy throat, runny nose, a bit of a cough, uh, then that person does need to be keeping themselves separate from everyone else in the household as soon as they start to feel sick. And so that means not sharing meals with the family. Uh, ideally, they would have their own bedroom. In a, a perfect world, they would have their own bathroom, but if that's not possible, making sure the bathroom is cleaned after they use it uh, and before it's used by others, and making sure that that person isn't sharing things like dishes, utensils, uh, kind of those common items with other members of the household. And then the, uh, the recommendation would be that they would get tested, and if they test positive for COVID, what they would need to do is follow all those same things that I just described, keeping separate from others, keeping in their own space in the house, ideally, uh, making sure that, again, they're not, not sharing those utensils, not coming within two meters of family members, and they would need to be kept in, in that sort of isolation for 10 days from the start of when they, they had their first symptom, when they started to feel sick. And so if they're feeling well by 10 days after that, then they could come back and uh, be with other family members again, we have a really good clean to the area that they were, wash the bedding, you know, wash that bathroom, make sure everything gets cleaned, all those surfaces, door handles, all of those kinds of things. Um, and that's, you know, obviously in a setting where, where people do have a separate space for that sick person to be. Some households are small and there's lots of people in them and it can be really difficult for a sick person to stay separate from others. And if that's the situation that someone is in, then, uh, Public health does call every single person who tests positive for COVID. And then that contact mm -hmm. tracing piece is where uh, the contact tracers will be asking who that person was in close contact with from the time that they had symptoms and actually up to two days before their symptoms started. Because we know that some people can pass the virus to others even before they start to feel sick. 
And so then those people who were in the household, uh, then they also need to be staying home. Those people who were in close contact with that person who's now got COVID, they need to be staying separate from the case, but also separate from others so that uh, they can't pass the virus to others. So those close household contacts would not be able to go to work, would not be able to uh, go for groceries, that kind of thing. They would really need to stay home for two weeks from the last time that they had that close contact with the case. That can be difficult, especially if you have one person who's sick and everyone else in the household is a close contact. And that's again where uh, if you have friend networks, family networks, you can drop off groceries, give support so that people don't have to leave the house in that 14 day period is going to be so important. But again, that's where the public health contact tracers, when they phone the household to talk to that person who has COVID, if there are challenges, so for example, if that person who's sick, if there really is no space in the house for them to be separate from others, then it's really important to talk to the, the public health uh, contact tracer about that, about those challenges. Uh, and in, in some circumstances, uh, then public health is able to find another place for that person to stay for the 10 days that the, the person who's sick for the 10 days that they have to stay separate from others. So I hope that helps. It's, uh, it can be a bit complicated because we have the 10 day rule for people who are sick and the 14 day rule for people who are contacts. Um, but, uh, but that's sort of the general idea is keeping separate and then waiting out that 10 day period, making sure that people are well. If they still are sick past 10 days, then they do need to stay isolated and away from others until they feel well, if it's a bit longer than 10 days. Now, next we have a question from a mom in Calgary. This came in earlier today. I am keeping my kid in my house, but he sees his friends running around the neighborhood and playing together with other kids. How do I explain this to him? And this is one I have heard before, mm -hmm. and I think it's a tricky one because as we were talking before this started, it's it's kind of like many things, many rules that we as parents put in place, but maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and it can be a tough one, especially when, when kids want to do something and they see their friends doing it and they don't think it's fair that, that they don't get to do what their friends do. And, and we were talking about this a little bit before the event started and and saying that ultimately uh, there's lots of decisions that we as parents make for our kids that are different from what other families do and every family makes decisions based on what's important to them on their situation maybe there's someone in the household who has uh, a medical condition or they're at high risk um, and so every family is going to need to make decisions based on their situation and rules for their kids based on you know again what what they see is important so you know, if, if your uh, child is looking outside and seeing friends biking and playing together who maybe aren't following the distancing rules and, uh, and they really would love to be out there with their friends, again, I think it's a matter of, of having the same conversation you'd have if, if their friends are allowed to play video games for longer than they are or they're allowed to uh, eat foods that you don't allow in your house. It, it's about that same conversation. Why we make the choices we do as our family and why those are different from some other families and the same thing is true for this, that the, uh, the risk of the virus and the risk of catching it um, mm -hmm. can be different for different families depending on their situation. And as I've said, my recommendation really is to take this seriously to try to prevent transmission. Um, and some families you know, may choose to, to not follow those recommendations. Uh, but again, I think it's important that people are clear with their children about why they are following particular guidance and what's important to them as a family. Thank you. Now we have a question from Ashley May. When are daycares going to be notified so we can notify parents? Lots of parents messaging and calling in. And we do know, uh, you know, as we I think alluded to a little bit earlier, that Dr. Hinshaw will be making that call uh, along with my colleagues on the Emergency Management Cabinet Committee uh, about when we know that that relaunch will happen. I know that's that's somewhat uncertain, but we also don't know what's going to happen in the coming days as it pertains to um, numbers of cases and what that's looking like. 
Um, we will be sharing that again with daycare operators across the province uh, tomorrow. Um, my office will be following up uh, with an email to all of you. Um, we have heard that centers are maybe cautiously planning. I know we've got a long weekend coming up, so in fact a lot of centers are planning for the following week, um, cautiously, optimistically I would say. Um, and, you know, I, I know you can appreciate that this is a very unprecedented situation and there's a lot of uncertainty here, um, but we are working uh, both of our offices together as quickly as we can to get you all of that information. Did I miss anything there? No. No. <laughs> uh, we have a child from Vermilion who said, oh my goodness, this is a... Good question. Uh, why are we still in school in the middle of a global emergency? Like, let's face it, nobody wants to be here, so let's call it a year already. I can understand that this is definitely a stressful situation, um, not only for you as a student, um, but also, you know, your teachers are working really, really hard to make sure that you're able to learn while you're at home. And I know your parents are working really hard too. I know school could be tough at the best of times, and so this is a unique situation. Um, and it's a lot harder when you don't get to hang out with your friends, and I think we all understand that that's pretty tricky. Uh, so it is important to get a final grade. Uh, it's important to keep learning even when a lot is changing. Specifically, I know a, a lot of work is being done on reading and math, um, and learning is also a lot about discovering new things, and there's a lot you can discover when you're in a brand new situation. This pandemic would be a great example. Um, and so hang in there, uh, hang in there, get outside, try to maybe do some Zoom calls with your friends. I know lots of teachers are coordinating those for their classes. Uh, lots of parents are coming together to make sure that that can happen. Yeah. Anything else to add, Dr. No, Hanshaw? No, I think that covered it. <laughs> <laughs> this is when you ask children for questions, you get real interesting questions. So from Kara Wolf we have, I'm pregnant and due in four weeks. Is my mother allowed to watch my other daughter while I give birth? And when can we see my family again? My 23 month daughter doesn't social distance. I can sympathize with that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for, for young kids, it, it's not possible to just say, stay two meters away. And, and I think that this is, it's really tough because with our kids, we don't want them to grow up in fear, right? So I, I know that this is really hard when kids in growing up at this time, it's a whole different reality and we're all trying to navigate this together to manage the risk of exposure with the risk of all of our public health measures and trying to find our way through and navigate this. So, you know, with respect to the question of whether or not your mother can watch your child, uh, I think it depends on certain circumstances, certainly in terms of being allowed or not allowed. Again, this is not something that um, anyone's going to you know, step in and, and give you a ticket if, if you uh, ask your mother to watch your daughter. I think that that would be about the risk um, assessment in the family. And if, if you and your daughter are, uh, you know, haven't been going out and spending a lot of time with other people, then the risk that, uh, that your daughter has the virus would be pretty minimal and so you know I think the having your your mother watch her while you're uh, giving birth to to your new baby would would be fine um, but again it depends on the the risk tolerance and your circumstances and and where your daughter's been if she's been in, in contact with other people uh, whether or not your mother has any chronic health conditions that she's worried about but I think that those are all things that families need to sort through and then that question of when you can see family again, you know, honestly, I think that as we ease back into this reopening, I think we're all going to have to be thinking about who we're choosing. And again, we've talked about this cohort family concept and thinking about what, what that kind of cohort bubble is where you have those people in your life that you can be close to, that you can let your daughter run up and give a hug to, that you, know, you can kind of create that mm -hmm. circle. Uh, the important thing is trying to keep that circle relatively small as we ease into this reopening. And again, doing that balancing act of we need to be cautious against the risk of the virus. We also need to make sure that uh, we're easing up on some of the other things that are causing other health impacts. And I think I also heard you say today, 
we're as we move through these stages, we're going to be moving from this stay home to more of a stay safe mm -hmm. and recognizing that these things are going to change a little bit as we move forward. Yep, that's exactly it. And congratulations, by the way. <laughs> I hope that your last four weeks go well. <laughs> So we have a question from Tina Jones. If you're the Tina Jones I know from Calgary, hello, Tina. Um, a question from her daughter, who is 13. Do you think it will be okay to go back to school in September? It makes me a little scared. And this, I, I mean, I totally get it. This is something that is new and that can be incredibly scary. Um, but your mom or dad will make sure that it's safe and we will be doing that too. And as I said, Minister LaGrange is working um, very hard. She's um, speaking with your school divisions and with uh, your teachers and principals and hearing feedback from parents like yours um, and we'll be making those decisions uh, with all of those people's input. But we certainly you know, want to make sure that you know that when you're able to go back to school, it will be safe. Yeah, and you know what, around the world, a lot of countries are going back and opening their schools up. And I think we're going to be learning a lot of lessons from other countries about what works to keep uh, students safe in school and, and staff and, and teachers. And so I think we'll have over the next few months a lot of opportunities to see what works and, and what uh, challenges other countries are experiencing. So we can incorporate those things, we can include those things in our planning mm -hmm. for schools here. Good question. Now we have one from Haley Beauregard. What would you suggest to a family who have a medically fragile three-year-old with a heart condition, chronic lung disease, and low T cells count? We have been self-isolating since March 14th. That's tough. I mean, it's, it's uh, challenging to support a child with uh, medical condition, uh, even when there is no pandemic to worry about. So uh, I you know, absolutely uh, would sympathize with some of those challenges. I, I think ultimately for anyone, you know, wh whether it's a three-year-old or any other member of the family who has medical conditions like the ones that you are talking about, there is a higher risk of that person having severe disease if they get infected. So, I mean, I guess my advice would be to be thinking carefully about the situations that uh, you are in and making sure that all of those, those things about physically distancing from others, uh, regular hand washing, and making sure that uh, certainly if, if you are planning to, to go and, and be with any other families, that there's no one there who's sick. Uh, but this, it's, it's gonna be tough, and I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, I wish I could make it easier, but I, I think it just will be tough for the next many months until we have a better way of either treating or preventing the virus because um, really all we can do at this stage is prevent spread by all of those measures mm -hmm. and so I think there are a lot of families that are in this situation where they're protecting their kids they're protecting members of the family and that will mean restricted activities uh, in order to to protect those household members that's really all we have right now to uh, prevent spread unfortunately we also have a question here from Jessica Conlin is it okay to go out with my friends if we stay on our bikes my son asked me the same one, I think, two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I think being outside and biking together, as long as uh, you're not biking kind of right side by side, you know, you still have to be thinking about how you're, how far apart you are, um, I think is fine. It's a matter of, again, trying to, to maintain that distance and uh, knowing that sometimes things happen and sometimes bike crashes happen and people need help. So that is certainly, you know, obviously you can still help each other, but as long as you try to, to stay that distance apart and, and you're riding your bikes in that same general area, then that should be okay. Or, you know, in my case, I know as I told you, Dr. Hinshaw, we were biking down the street and all of a sudden I looked over and my son was on his friend's scooter and the friend was on his bike and I thought, <laughs> oh no, this cannot happen. <laughs> Hand washing, sanitizing, <laughs> home we go. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially with young kids. <laughs> oh, I know. It's tough. It's it's hard. Yeah. These have been really great questions so far. So thank you to all of you uh, who are asking uh, these questions and have joined us tonight. We do have a few minutes left, but I want you to let you know that if
if we don't get to your question uh, right now, we will make sure that we answer them on Facebook later so that you have a chance to get your uh, question answered. Our next question, question is from Rachel Lee. Thanks so much for doing this. Appreciate your time, leadership, and insights. Thank you so much, Rachel. Do you have thoughts on new research indicating that kids actually aren't as susceptible to the virus? So you know, it's an excellent question. And we learn more about the virus every day and try to adjust our policies uh, as we go. And so I was reading about a study the other day from China that at least their, their research seemed to indicate that kids were about 30% less likely to get the virus um, in terms of if they're exposed to it. Uh, but on the flip side of it, they also said that just because of the way that kids interact with each other, mm -hmm. for any given exposure, they may be about a third less likely to catch it, but then they have many more exposures if they're all kind of together in, in a, uh, an environment where it's hard to distance. Having said that, it is extremely clear from the, the evidence that we have to date that children are much less likely than older adults to have severe disease. And so most kids who do get infected will have relatively mild illness. Some kids won't actually really have any symptoms at all. Uh, and so again, there's all of these trade-offs. And, and again, that earlier question that is a really good one about that um, wish to, to just let kids get out there and spread it all around and make them immune. Uh, and and if, if we were confident that that immunity would happen, and also about the fact that if we could somehow create that bubble uh, where and if we knew in advance which of those kids would go on to have severe disease, mm -hmm. that small proportion, uh, and also guarantee that the kids who got sick wouldn't be passing it on to household yeah. members or in other settings to people who are more likely to have severe disease. Um, it, you know, it seems like a really attractive option. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all to say that, that yes, absolutely, there's a research that, that does indicate um, that kids you know, may be less likely if they're exposed to pick it up, uh, but there are some of those flip sides as well. And so again, this is all about how do we as families figure out how we adjust our risk tolerance and not only keep our families safe, but then think about how we keep others around us safe as well, right? That we're all, we still are all in this together and will be for the next many months. So we have a time for a couple more questions here. Uh, the next one is from Candace Steely. What phase of reopening do you think indoor children's activities will be included in? For example, dance classes with less than 15 participants. My nine-year-old is inquiring about this. <laughs> Yes, and I know so many children's activities that have been paused. Um, so uh, we were actually just talking about this earlier this week uh, in the context of the summer camps, actually, uh, with the thinking that possibly some of these kinds of activities could open maybe on a trial basis in terms of summer camp uh, type activities and see how they go with distancing and restrictions on numbers. And so right now, that's kind of what we're thinking about. We're working really hard to get all of our planning ready for all of the stage one activities. So some things like the indoor children's activities, uh, we haven't sifted through all those details yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will also say, I know, you know, I've heard from people who say, well, you know, this particular activity, we could do all of these things and it would be safe. So can we do that right now, please? And I think that what's really important to remember is that almost any activity that we could think of or a particular kind of sector of society, we probably could put a bunch of things in place to make it mostly safe most mm -hmm. of the time. But the more things that we open at the same time and layer all of the kind of small risk increments together, the, the bigger the overall kind mm -hmm. of risk is. So we do have to work through these stages a little bit at a time. And again, the, uh, the indoor activities one is one that probably, again, we're looking at those day camps as a possible uh, time when they might start. Mm -hmm. Now a question from Jess Sugar: Will playgrounds be opening anytime soon? <laughs> so we also were talking about this question beforehand. So you know, as, as moms of young kids, I think we, <laughs> we get a lot of the same questions. Uh, so playgrounds, a lot of playgrounds are actually closed by the cities and the cities were the ones who kind of put around that yellow tape. And that's because playgrounds are places where a lot of kids are touching the same surfaces, mm -hmm. touching the same equipment. And so while 
in, in my orders, I didn't have a formal legal restriction on playgrounds. Certainly playgrounds can be a rest area. So that question of when they're going to be open again um, is, is, I think, a question that we haven't answered yet. And again, I think it's a matter of wanting to think through how do we try to make these things safe? We know that kids, and especially young kids, if there's a bunch of kids together on the playground, it will be really hard to keep them two meters apart. And even if they are, one person goes across the monkey bars, the next person goes across. So you have lots of surfaces that lots of kids are touching um, and that there can be risk of spreading. So I don't know when we'll be able to open playgrounds, uh, but I think we do need to wait a little bit longer to get a little bit more information about this virus, how it acts outside. We also don't know how long it can last on the surface outside as opposed to how long it can last on the surface inside. So whether or not you know the sun and uh, other elements outside might kill the virus faster, we don't know these things. So we're still learning and hopefully we'll get that information soon. Now we have a really great question from Jessica Ann Gish and she says, my three-year-old is becoming scared of germs mm -hmm. and there being germs at daycare. Perhaps he made the connection from mommy's chatter. And it, it is true that uh, they are listening to so many of the things that we say. So any advice on how to manage both my son's concerns as well as mom's? Yeah, and, and that's tough. I mean, again, I, I think we were talking about uh, trying to do have, have that balance because we want our kids to be cautious. And I think one of the things that we can do is talk to our kids about the ways that they can keep themselves safe, that they can you know, wash their hands, they can, uh, if they are feeling a little bit sick, that they need to stay home to protect others. You know, some of those things that they can have a little bit more power over. But I, I also think that it's really important in all of this that, that we don't swing so far on that fear side that our kids sort of grow up in this anxious environment. And that's really tough to find that right balance. But again, I think making sure that, that kids know that um, we do need to be uh, careful about germs, we need to wash our hands well, we need to, you know, if a toy drops on the ground, uh, to make sure that toy gets, gets washed again before, especially, you know, if it's a toy that another person has been playing with, some of those kinds of things. But also to reassure them that uh, if they do get a germ that they're going to be taken care of and uh, and that no matter what, you know, their family's there to support them and uh, there's doctors and nurses who will help them and, you know, trying again to, to help balance out this, uh, this new world that we're all living in and, and it's not easy, so I sympathize, but that's my best advice, I mm -hmm. don't know you would add anything to that? I think that's the same. I mean, I've been trying to tell my son that, well, and, and my daughter, she's young, a little wild, and so this is not a conversation that we have at the age of two, but certainly with my son, you know, that's one of the things that I typically try to tell him is, you know, keep washing your hands, wash them really good with soap, um, and, you know, given the conversation about the viruses, I say, you know, there's lots of germs out there and lots of them don't make you sick, but this is a very new kind of germ and a new kind of virus and our bodies don't have what they need to fight them yet. And so for lack of a better explanation, I, I erred on keeping it simple mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and trying not to create fear because yeah. I think they already have anxiety about you know, why can't I go outside? Why can't I go to the store? Why can't I play with my friends? Um, why can't I go, you know, my kids ask, why can't I go to the Y? Why can't I, right? Why can't I go swimming? And so I kind of just focus on like, let's just try to stay safe. There's yeah. lots of germs out there. Germs aren't always bad. They prepare your body to fight um, other viruses, but mm. this this is a new one and we have to be careful. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's, that's great. And I, I think it is totally fair. I can't remember if I said this, so I want to say it just to make sure I did. Uh, that to say to kids, even if you do get sick, um, most kids who get this virus mm -hmm. don't get that sick. But we need to try to, to prevent or we need to mm -hmm. try and, and stop ourselves from getting it so that we protect people around us. But yeah. if you do get it, if you do get this germ, this virus, um, that we'll just need to make sure we stay away from people mm -hmm. for a little while and that it'll be okay. So, you know, I think especially to make sure that kids know yeah. that. Uh, catching a germ isn't going to necessarily be yeah. really drastic. 
uh, but that we need to protect other people if we do get sick. Yeah, that's a really good point. And so I know we have a couple uh, more questions here. Um, one is from Kadia. Hi, I have asthma, so COVID-19 is quite dangerous for me. Are there any extra measures I should take to protect myself? So, and these exactly are the, are the questions about, um, or kind of the reasons why we, uh, we collectively need to be taking care of each other, because ultimately, um, someone who has asthma, as you say, is at higher risk from complications, from having a more severe disease. And so I think really the, the measures are essentially the same as, as we're recommending that everyone take, uh, although you, know, you may need to make sure that, uh, that you're following them a little bit more cautiously than other people might. So thinking about where, where you go out when you do leave the house, you know, where are you going, who are you gonna be with, how can you stay two meters apart, Really be thinking about the surfaces that you touch, you know, door handles, elevator buttons, making sure that you have hand sanitizer to be able to clean your hands regularly. And, you know, we are talking a lot about masks. We've had a lot of questions about masks, especially as we move into the mm -hmm. relaunch. And a lot of people wanting to know, you know, should I be wearing a mask? Should I not be wearing a mask? What we know about masks right now is that wearing them out in public is a better way for the mask wearer to protect others than necessarily for the mask wearer to protect themselves. Uh, it's unclear if there's a really good protection while, if you wear a mask to be protected from others, um, but we are seeing that if a lot of people are wearing masks, and that's something that we're working on uh, updating our recommendations about, that as we're going back out and about and we're trying to keep our two meter distance, but maybe it's not always possible, the more we can encourage people to wear masks, the less um, transmission might be happening, mm -hmm. especially from people who don't have symptoms, uh, but maybe you're incubating the virus. So I think one additional precaution that you may want to take if it's possible is if you are perhaps going out and you're going to see a few friends, you're trying to stay socially distanced, you may want to ask your friends to wear masks for the time that you're together. We don't recommend masks for kids under two, just to be clear. Uh, that it is, you know, older older mm -hmm. kids, but uh, that may be one additional precaution that you may want to take, and and your friends uh, can do that to help protect you. So now I think we have two more questions left. The first one is from Sabrina. What phase are preschools in, and will out of school care programs located in schools be able to open on May 14th? And this is one I know our offices have been working pretty closely on because I know that there weren't specific parameters around play schools uh, or preschools uh, in the relaunch strategy. But I think what we've landed on um, is that it, it may be treated somewhat like a summer camp uh, situation. And so those may be permitted and we will be providing that information as well uh, in our update to daycares and to preschools and to out-of-school care centers tomorrow. Uh, when it comes to out-of-school care, um, I think the, the reminder here is that schools aren't closed, but in-person classes were canceled. And so that's something that uh, we were also looking for guidance um, on, and I reached out to the Minister of Education, uh, her office, to determine what that might look like. Um, in many cases, it looks like that may be up to a school board uh, or a school division if they want to um, open those centers, um, but there may also be decisions around whether or not they have outside access and things like that. So we'll be looking into that and providing uh, more detail on that in the coming days as well. And now I think this is our last question from Nancy Kate. Do you have any suggestions for how both parents and kids can help keep a positive mental attitude during this challenging time? Are there any particular activities you recommend? Um, I mean, I love getting outside so I can jump in. My kids love biking, I love running. Uh, and so I've tried to do those types of things either earlier or later in the day. Um, to keep a little bit of extra space along the paths. Um, we like to plant gardens. I'm not a very good gardener, but we like to do it. And as long as my children don't pull them out, they, things tend to grow, so that's positive. <laughs> um, but this is a great season for that. And lots of plant stores have things like curbside pickups. You can order seeds online. Uh, so personally, those are some of the things that we're doing in our family. How about yours? 
You know, one of the things that uh, has been interesting for me anyways, and, and it depends on the day for my kids, yeah. but uh, to be thinking about the people in our family who aren't necessarily nearby, but who mm -hmm. we can call or Skype mm -hmm. with and connect that way. So it's actually been kind of a good opportunity. You know, we had a, a Skype family meeting at Easter time or a Zoom meeting where we got to see family members that I hadn't seen mm -hmm. in forever because we weren't just gathering with people who we could drive to, we were gathering with everyone. So it didn't matter if people were in, you know, a different country, they could still join us and we could all be together. <laughs> so that that was great and you know, the kids actually got to kind of meet some cousins who they hadn't seen before. And, oh, cool. and we, uh, we also did some activities together. So we you know, had the Zoom and you know, we would kind of do a little bit of a, an Easter egg hunt thing and then my you know, nephews would do a little bit of that. So we were able to, mm -hmm. to share that activity virtually, mm -hmm. which was kind of fun because then the kids can see, you know, their cousins and, and we can kind of do that activity together. So using some of those virtual means also can be a way of, of uh, breaking things up a bit or thinking about maybe sending a card to somebody that you haven't seen very much or thinking about how you can... Um, share part of your day with somebody else that maybe you haven't seen in a while. Mm -hmm. that, those are great ideas too. I know um, my kids have received mail from other kids in their class and the Zoom calls. I think it's mostly all of the children taking turns and bringing their toys to the camera and showing their friends all of the toys uh, from their bedroom, <laughs> which is amusing. <laughs> um, but also if you're getting out there and walking, you probably see lots of sidewalk chalk out there and families are decorating their windows to cheer up their neighbors and things like that. I don't know about you, but that makes me so happy to see. Yeah, the stuffed animals <laughs> in the windows. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So, and you know, I think that um, even then sharing different ideas with friends and, you know, there's friends that I'm connecting with that, again, this is sort of an opportunity for people to mm -hmm. reach out sometimes and talk to people you haven't in a while and sharing ideas about, well, what's helped you and your family yeah. and how, how are you keeping your kids busy? Because this is, it's hard on all of us. and. I think sometimes we have to take a breath and realize, mm -hmm. wow, like a couple of months ago, we were in a totally different world and now we're just kind mm -hmm. of adjusting and thinking, how do we move out of this? But it's this uh, new reality that uh, we really need to lean on mm -hmm. each other to get through. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hinshaw. We really appreciate your time. I know you're really busy. Um, thank you to all of you kids, parents out there who took the time to join us tonight and to ask us all of your questions. Thank you so much. Um, I do also know that this is a very difficult time and not only for parents, um, for kids. And I, I've said this uh, quite a few times in the last couple of weeks um, when we're looking at what's happening, not only as a result of this pandemic, but also with the economic crisis that we're facing, this is a really difficult time for families. And so it is important to reach out, um, but we also know that lots of those really stressful situations that families find themselves in are made worse at a time like this by all of these additional pressures. So if you're a kid and you need somebody to talk to, Kids Help Phone is there. They are there 24 seven. It is 1-800-668-6868. Or on your phone, you can text CONNECT to 686868, and we will include uh, that information on the screen for you. It's really important to take care of your mental health. Parents, continue to share how you deal with stress and practice um, and model those coping, coping mechanisms with your kids. Find an activity that de-stresses you as a parent. Um, whether that is any of the things that we just addressed in that last question, reading, running, cooking together as a family, sidewalk chalk, um, cheering up your neighbors. Also, finally, you can sign up for free daily texts through the Text for Hope program to help you identify and adjust negative thoughts and feelings during a pandemic. You can text COVID-19 HOPE to 393939 to subscribe. So thank you again for joining us. For any other information on COVID-19, uh, you can visit the website uh, alberta.ca slash COVID.